This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Figueredo Report. I am Humanist Mike, and this is episode 263 of the program. Today is Friday, October 23rd, and we are just over a week away from the big election, and we're going to talk about all of that. But before we dive into those topics, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make this show possible. All of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us. And that includes Bonnie Verhunts, 1111, Francis Ellis, Jockey Boy, Jan Weisbart, Linda Childers, Ravi Yajnik, Ryan Skates, The Product DS, Trey Palmer, and Walid Damuni. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, enjoy the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com com slash support patreon.com slash humanist report or by clicking join underneath any one of our youtube videos and if you have no money you can still support us by liking all of our videos and commenting on all of our videos believe it or not that does actually go a long way i just hit my nose on the microphone that does go a long way <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's let's get to the show because we have quite a bit to talk about. This week, Donald Trump's latest attack on Joe Biden is so terribly stupid that Joe Biden is actually promoting it. That's how bad it is. And while we're on the subject of Joe Biden, we'll discuss the prospect of Republicans being part of his cabinet if he's elected. Rapper 50 Cent makes an endorsement in the presidential election, and Pat Robertson makes a very bold prediction about the election. And in the event Trump loses the election, MAGA chuds do have a plan B. Trump Jr. Ted Cruz tries to concoct a plan to block Democrats from packing the Supreme Court. And during a pandemic, the rich are still getting richer and the poor are getting even more poor. A CNN reporter visited a QAnon rally and it was entertaining to say the least. And finally, we'll talk about Alison Camarota's latest voter panel from September that we missed, and she kind of gauges where voters are at and what their thoughts are on the current election. But first, we will talk about some phenomenal news, uh, the landslide victory in Bolivia for Evo Morales' Socialist Party. Uh, it was phenomenal, so of course we have to start the show with that, because it's not very often that we get good news, so I want to take the time to celebrate first before we talk about anything else and get into the more like heavy uh demoralizing stuff so let's get right to it enjoy the show everyone folks i know that it's a monday in 2020 but regardless i still have some surprisingly good news the coup in bolivia the coup attempt in bolivia by the united states government has officially failed because they held an election and the socialists didn't just win. They won big. They won in a landslide, according to exit polls, capturing 52.4% of the vote. The socialist party, MAS, formerly run by Evo Morales, has won big. So much so that there will be no need for a runoff election in November. And this was such a decisive victory that the fascist president, the individual who, let me remind you, declared herself the president after Eva Morales was ousted, Janine Añez, even she was forced to concede. And this led to people dancing in the streets in the middle of the night celebrating this victory and of uh, fascists such as Fernando Camacho crying as the results came in. And after the news broke, former president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, stated that he will be returning to his country because he was exiled once the fascists came to power and he was in Argentina, but uh, he's coming back. So this is just phenomenal news. And before we get into the specifics here about this, uh, I just want to explain to you why this is so important. This situation could have been absolutely deadly if the fascists hung on to power. Because back when the United States government overthrew the uh, socialist government in Chile, Salvador Allende, guess what happened? Pinochet came to power. And he was one of the most brutal dictators the world has ever seen. So we were looking at a situation where Janine Añez could have been as brutal as Pinochet. And there were already signs that this was a very violent and repressive regime that we were seeing starting to emerge. Um, so that's one of the reasons why 
this is important because lives are probably going to be saved, countless lives, because this election went this way. Um, and second of all, it also signals that the United States government is losing its influence in Latin America because what did we just try to do a year ago, a little over a year ago? We just tried to overthrow Maduro in Venezuela and install Juan Guaido, our puppet. That failed, and now our coup attempt here in Bolivia also failed. And yes, you should question our motives because, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the countries that we always target and want regime change in happen to have a lot of resources. In Venezuela, they have the number one oil reserves in the world. In Bolivia, lots and lots of lithium, which private corporations in America want. So this is a victory for the people and for the world, quite frankly, for the international socialist movement. So for more details on this, we go to Jake Johnson of Common Dreams, who explains a year after former Bolivian president Evo Morales was ousted in a military coup that installed a brutal far-right regime, Morales' ally, Luis Arque, declared victory in the South American nation's high-stakes presidential election early Monday after exit polls showed the socialist candidate with a large advantage over his two main competitors. Quote, democracy has won, Arque, who served as Morales' finance minister, said in an address to the nation after one exit poll showed him leading the race with 52.4% of the vote and former President Carlos Mesa in a distant second with 31.5%. Right-wing candidate Luis Camacho, an ally of unelected interim president Janine Añez, won just 14.1% of the vote. That's astonishing, according to the survey. The Washington Post reported that if the exit poll numbers are confirmed by the official count, which was being tabulated slowly late Sunday, it would be more than enough to avoid a November runoff and claim outright victory. Arke characterized his apparently decisive victory, which Añez was forced to acknowledge as a mandate to continue the policies of the Morales government, which lifted millions of Bolivians out of poverty and expanded the nation's economy. I think the Bolivian people want to retake the path we were on, Arke said Monday. Twice postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic, Sunday's election was a do-over of last year's presidential contest, which was thrown into chaos after the U.S.-dominated Organization of American States, OAS, leveled baseless allegations of fraud by Morales, who was eventually forced to resign and flee the country under threat by Bolivia's military. The coup against Morales sparked a wave of indigenous-led protests that were violently repressed by the Bolivian military and police forces, which were granted sweeping immunity from prosecution by the anti-indigenous Añez government. The OAS allegations were indeed the main political foundation of the coup that followed the October 20th election three weeks later, Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, wrote last month. But they provided no evidence to support these allegations, because there wasn't any. This has since been established repeatedly repeatedly by a slew of expert statistical studies. So this really is just excellent news. However, the question is, why did this happen in the first place? Why was there a coup attempt? Why did the OAS declare their electoral victory fraudulent? Well, this is about lithium. This is what Evo Morales said. But I want you to hear it from Evo Morales himself, because he explained in an interview with Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept that this really was a lithium coup, as he called it, because what they were doing was they were taking the money that they were making from lithium in this country and they were helping to lift people out of poverty, using their country's resources to benefit their own people. And the United States government, mostly uh, large multinational corporations, private companies, they didn't like that they weren't getting a piece of the pie. So this ended up leading to a coup. And Evo Morales puts it concisely and explains quite simply, this is about lithium and that's it. Ni una empresa norteamericana se adjudica. Claro, ellos están siempre con la mentalidad de competitividad y además de eso, ellos están con una mentalidad de, de privatizadora. Y no esas políticas, no. El Estado va a industrializar, ya puede haber socios, pero fundamentalmente que prestan servicio. En Temarito teníamos propuesta 41 plantas. La mayoría de industria de industria de litio, por ejemplo, hidróxido de litio, carbonato de litio, cloruro de potasio, estaba la planta de batería, ¿no? los otros para insumos y los otros para subproductos, subproductos para medicamentos y para alimentos. Yo no soy experto, pero obligo de entender, debatiendo con los técnicos, con ministros, viceministros, gerentes del tema de litio. Ya hemos empezado, el año pasado llegamos, inauguramos una planta, como hace un momento comentaba, de cloruro de potasio, estamos exportando. Estamos exportando litio, pero de la planta pilote, el próximo año vamos a inaugurar la planta de la industria de carbonato de litio. 
Entonces yo siento que, que ese, ese sector energético es tan importante que desde Bolivia, inclusive teníamos la oportunidad de poner el precio de litio para todo el mundo, pero con participación, Europa, China, Asia, y esté fuera de Estados Unidos, eso no soporta. Que un indio maneje eso, y como Estado además de eso. Entonces yo sigo convencido, este es un golpe de Estado al litio. This was a lithium coup d'etat, that's what he called it. Now, with Venezuela, John Bolton admitted the quiet part out loud, uh, remember in an interview with Fox News where he said, you know, it really would be nice if American companies and Venezuelan companies, of course, got access to Venezuela's oil. So this is always about natural resources, always about natural resources. And um, they don't work this time. And it's funny because these private companies who wanted access to Bolivia's lithium, they were so confident that they could actually carry out this coup successfully that they were literally bragging about it because Tesla CEO Elon Musk, when confronted about his company monetarily benefiting from Bolivia's lithium, said, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. Yeah, seems like not so much anymore, right, Elon? So I know that you're going to say, Mike, you're oversimplifying the situation. No, it really is that simple. It really is that simple. You just have to connect the dots. And I want to go to a tweet from Artie Hale, who has the most concise summary that we need. If someone is confused about this situation, show them this tweet because it explains perfectly what happened. So uh, for those unclear about Bolivia's situation, one, Bolivia democratically elected socialists. Two, U.S. wanted Bolivia's lithium. Three, socialists said no. Four, U.S. claimed fraudulent elections. Five, U.S. overthrew socialists. Six, evidence showed U.S. lied. Seven, socialists won general election again. Eight, imperialism lost. And this is a happy ending for now. We don't know what the future will bring, but for now, this is a really huge rebuke of fascism in Bolivia. And it's a message to the U.S. government that we are not going to allow you to continue to destroy our democracies so private companies, private American corporations can make money off of us, make money off of our suffering. So you can install brutal regimes that repress our people. And you do so under the guise of promoting democracy. Like this is really phenomenal news. And let me just say uh, what's obvious here. Uh, this proves that socialism really is the antidote to fascism because the material conditions that lead to people becoming so desperate that they're even susceptible to being radicalized into fascism, those are all addressed with socialism. And guess what? They experienced socialism under Evo Morales and it was working. His government lifted millions of Bolivians out of poverty because rather than just taking all of the resources that Bolivia has and hoarding it, they actually benefited the people. They used the resources of Bolivia to create social programs that lifted people out of poverty, and it worked. But in order to make sure that a population can benefit off of their own natural resources, you know, you have to make sure that you resist imperialism by the U.S. government and other countries as well. Um, and it's been difficult because the United States has a lot of influence in the region. This has been basically their backyard. Latin America has been their backyard and they've been dominant, but now they're starting to lose that influence, and that's a really good sign. And this isn't just good for Bolivia. I mean, it's really great for Bolivia, but this shows that the international socialist movement is growing. It's more powerful. It's legitimized now. Um, so this is great. Uh, I look forward to seeing Evo Morales returning to power, um, uh, may maybe being part of the party again. This is just honestly, um, I'm a little bit shocked by this news because when i saw the news roll in on sunday evening i thought okay we'll, we'll sleep on this and see because nothing good could come of this horrible wretched year it's not possible and i was proven wrong um my cynicism was uh proven wrong and this is just honestly such great news um for people in bolivia and around the world um you know it's a message to the u.s government you can't just you can't do what you want when you want for purposes of, you know, um, monetary gain for private corporations. This is, this is great news. Well, once again, COVID-19 cases are beginning to spike and we have easily surpassed 60,000 new cases 
over the last couple of days. Now, I don't know how bad it's going to get, how high that number will go, but this isn't necessarily surprising if you listen to the experts, the scientists, the epidemiologists, because they warned us that as the weather changes, as it gets colder and more and more people congregate indoors, this will lead to a spike in cases. So once again, the experts, the scientists have been proven right. Everything that they warned us about is now coming to fruition, but that doesn't stop idiots like Donald Trump and his ilk from still criticizing scientists, demonizing scientists. And it's honestly shocking because you'd think that if they actually had an interest in winning this election that's approaching in two weeks, they'd at least pretend to be grownups. But they don't know how to act like adults. They just don't. And just this week, we learned that Donald Trump called Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease expert, an idiot. And Trump's attacks on Anthony Fauci have gotten so bad that he revealed in a 60 Minutes interview, he now has to be accompanied by a security detail at all times because he receives so many death threats and his family is now receiving nonstop harassment. And this isn't just because of Donald Trump, it's also because of Fox News, OAN, Tucker Carlson, all of the sycophants around Donald Trump who support him, who are helping him perpetuate these attacks and smears on individuals like Dr. Fauci, who are just trying to give us the information that we desperately require because we need transparency, we need information, we need statistics, but Donald Trump doesn't want that because he thinks that this is all about him. It's all an attempt to make him look bad. But regardless, I mean, this has led to a massive backlash among the public, which is why Donald Trump is down in the polls currently. But what does he do? He ends up leaning into all of these idiotic attacks, attacks Dr. Fauci more, criticizes him even more. Um, and he just, he doesn't know how to help himself. Again, he can't even put up this facade that he cares, that he's taking the scientists seriously. And what is he doing now? Well, at a recent rally, he decided to attack Joe Biden in a way so mind-numbingly stupid. I have no doubt in my mind this is actually going to help Joe Biden. And the reason why I know that this is going to help Joe Biden is because even Joe Biden knows this is going to help him because he's promoting what Trump said here at this rally. If you vote for Biden, he will surrender your jobs to China. He will surrender your future to the virus. He's going to lock down. This guy wants to lock down. He'll listen to the scientists. If I listened totally to the scientists, we would right now have a country that would be in a massive depression instead of we're like a rocket ship. Take a look at the numbers. And that's despite the fact that we have like five or six of these Democrats keeping their states closed because they're trying to hurt us on November 3rd. But the numbers are so good anyway, they'd be even better. Look, as a leftist, I can find literally hundreds of reasons to attack Joe Biden. But what Trump just said there is not a reason why we'd attack Joe Biden. My argument would be that he's not listening to the scientists enough, right? Because during a pandemic, we need more than just for you to increase testing. We need a $2,000 a month UBI. We need Medicare for all. So if I'm going to criticize Joe Biden for anything, it's that he's not listening to the scientists enough. But what does Trump say? He's going to listen to the scientists mockingly. He says it as if that's a bad thing. Um, he says, I'll listen to the scientists. If I totally listened to the scientists, we would right now have a country that would be in a massive depression instead of uh, we're, we're like a rocket ship. Take a look at the numbers. That's what he says. So understand there that he has no concern whatsoever for the amount of people affected with COVID-19 or the people who have died, the 218,000 family members who lost a loved one because of this pandemic. All he cares about is the numbers. But if he actually listened to the scientists, it's not like we wouldn't be in an economic depression because that would depend on what we do. But regardless, we would still probably be in a depression right now. But the difference is that maybe we wouldn't have so many people infected with the illness. Maybe we wouldn't have so many people die from this disease because we have 4% of the world's population, but 25% of all COVID cases as of June. This is a failure of leadership. This shows that Donald Trump should have listened to scientists more. But now he is literally attacking Joe Biden, mocking him because he wants to listen to the scientists. I mean, you have to be an imbecile to think this is going to land. I, I honestly cannot believe that Donald Trump is using this line of attack right now when there's just a couple of weeks out until the election and he's down. He has to at least pretend to be a serious person, but he, he can't even fake it to make it. Now, this attack is so bad uh, that Joe Biden is promoting it. 
because Joe Biden even knows this is going to help him. So in response to a headline on Twitter from The Hill saying uh, Trump says Biden will listen to scientists if elected, Joe Biden responded simply by saying dot 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 yes. And that's all he has to say. Listen, if your attacks are so bad that your opponent is willingly promoting them, you are running a terrible campaign. Now, on top of that tweet, Joe Biden also responded with an ad. Uh, but first, he says, for once, Donald Trump is correct. I will listen to scientists. And he then shared this video. If you vote for Biden, he'll listen to the scientists. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. He wants to listen to Dr. Fauci. I mean, the ad writes itself. The ad writes itself. In my opinion, some of the most effective anti-Trump Joe Biden ads have been videos that they've put out where they just like don't even edit Donald Trump. They just let Trump uh, have enough rope to hang himself. And that's it. You know, a video of Trump saying, if I lose this election to Joe Biden, I will go away forever. And then it cuts to Joe Biden saying, I'm Joe Biden. I approve this message. I mean, Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. It's hilarious. I mean, you love to see it because he needs to be defeated. But I mean, you, you just think that there'd be at least a little bit more common sense, if not like with him specifically, then the people around him would think, all right, this clearly is something that we shouldn't say. And it's that stupid because this is definitely going to play well, like with his cultists at his rallies. But I mean, overall, the normal, like the average person who's going to be voting is not going to like what Donald Trump is saying. If Trump says Joe Biden is going to listen to the scientists more, that is going to make them like Joe Biden more. And this was confirmed in a poll from last month that the New York Times and Siena College published, where they found that, I mean, Americans, they still trust medical scientists, the CDC and Dr. Fauci, overwhelmingly. It's not even close. So 84% of Americans trust medical scientists, and that does include 75% of Republicans. 77% of Americans trust the CDC. That includes 71% of Republicans. 67% uh, of Americans trust Dr. Fauci. That includes still a slight majority of Republicans at 51%. And only 26% of Americans trust Donald Trump when it comes to COVID-19. Now, when you compare Donald Trump and Dr. Anthony Fauci among trust within the Republican Party, you do see that most Republicans trust Trump more than Dr. Fauci, uh, although they still do trust scientists more than Donald Trump. But Donald Trump needs independents to win who trust Dr. Fauci and scientists more than him. So, I mean, if you're looking at this at face value and you think, okay, it looks like Republicans trust Trump more than Anthony Fauci, maybe we should let him lean into these attacks, you'd be mistaken because you already have Republicans on lock. The goal is to win undecided voters. The goal is to win independence. The goal is to get some of those Obama to Trump voters to remain loyal and uh, not flip back to the Democratic Party. That's if you're Donald Trump. But Donald Trump doesn't seem like he's playing to win. And that's good because he's got to go. But you'd think that there'd be at least a little bit more competence from the guy who actually ran a surprisingly good campaign in 2016. I mean, there were times where I questioned if he was serious about winning. But overall, he was more capable of reading the room in 2016. He knew that there was this anti-establishment populist sentiment throughout the country and he capitalized on it but now the mood in the country is entirely different people are exhausted when it comes to COVID-19 and he rightfully states you know that people are sick and tired of it they are um they have COVID-19 fatigue but it's because we're not doing anything about it we're all irritated that we still have to social distance and wear masks but that doesn't mean, oh, well, let's just stop doing it. That means let's get someone in there that's going to take it seriously. So look, this election is not over yet. It's not a foregone conclusion that Joe Biden is going to win. But if Donald Trump does in fact lose, this is definitely going to be part of the story. This is definitely going to be part of the reason why. Because he is so tone deaf that he can't even pretend that he's a responsible grown up. Where you're literally making fun of your opponent because they're going to trust the scientists during a global pandemic. I mean, if you do something like that, you deserve to lose because you're that out of touch. You're that dim-witted. Okay, we are going to talk about 50 Cent. Uh, this story is hilarious, but it's also simultaneously 
a little bit sad and depressing because it shows you just how greedy rich people are. So 50 Cent, he is worth an estimated $30 million. And he just made an endorsement entirely based on him keeping more of his cash. So um, the reason why he made an endorsement is because of Joe Biden's tax plan. Now, Joe Biden, as many of you know, is no progressive. But when you juxtapose his tax plan with Donald Trump's, Joe Biden's is much more progressive. Trump's is regressive. Any middle class tax cut that Donald Trump has included in his plan expires after 10 years. Whereas Joe Biden, I mean, this isn't the best tax rate ever. He's basically taxing anyone who makes more than $400,000 per year at a higher rate. I mean, that is more progressive, but it's not the most progressive tax plan because I would argue that if somebody makes more than 250000 even 100000 per year, they can afford a lot higher uh, of a tax rate. But I mean, 400000 that's perfectly reasonable. If you're going to raise taxes on anyone making that much money, that's fine. But 50 Cent apparently disagrees with that, and he tweeted out Joe Biden's tax plan and endorsed Donald Trump, saying, what the fuck? Vote for Trump. I'm out. Fuck New York. The Knicks never win anyway. I don't care that Trump doesn't like black people. Wow. 62% are you out of your fucking mind? Shut up! I don't care that Trump doesn't like black people. 62%. That is honestly astonishing to me. And it shows you how morally bankrupt rich people are. It shows you how money corrupts people at an individual level, like it doesn't just corrupt institutions. When we're talking about capitalism, we have to talk about the effect that it has on us psychologically as well, because this is this is destructive. You're telling all of your followers on Instagram and Twitter, hey, vote for the guy, even though he's racist, but I just care about keeping more of my money. So he might hurt you, he might hate black people, but hey, I want more money. 50 Cent, you have $30 million in net worth, you're gonna be okay. You're going to be fine. And I'm assuming that 50 Cent, like, doesn't even know the specifics about this. Like, we're talking about a marginal tax rate, which means that that 62% doesn't kick in until after you make $400,000 in one year. We're not talking about a wealth tax, which we should, where we just tax all of 50 Cent's 30 million wealth at 62%. Joe Biden is not saying, I'm going to take 62% of everything you own. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying that every dollar that 50 cent makes per year after $400,000 will be taxed at 62%. That is incredibly reasonable. It's been higher before. It's been in the 90s before in the United States. But either he's too stupid or too selfish to acknowledge that. And so this led to him basically saying, listen, to all of my supporters, I know, I know this man is a racist and he doesn't like you but I need this money. I need to make more money than I already have. I mean, you're never going to lose that money. Like you, you have 30 million in net worth. You're going to have that for the rest of your life. How old are you? In your 40s, 50s? You're going to have that forever. But yet you're so greedy that even though you acknowledge how harmful Donald Trump is to black Americans, demonstrably, his policies hurt them. You care only about yourself. That is the definition of selfish and just, it's perverted. It's, it's disgusting, honestly. Now, it's funny because he made this, I guess you could call it an endorsement. Not the most ringing endorsement, if we're going to call it that. Uh, but conservatives are so desperate, they still prop this up. They propped up the guy who endorsed Trump, even though he said he knows Trump hates black people. But because he said vote for Donald Trump, conservatives still loved it. So in the responses, Tommy Loren replied saying, welcome to the Trump train. And she also said, amen. Uh, Candace Owens also shared her excitement. Isn't Candace Owens the person who said that we don't care what celebrities think? Dear celebrities, I'm sorry to be the one to have to break this to you, but we do not care, not in the slightest particle of an imaginary thing, what you think. Sure, Jan. But if a celebrity endorses a conservative or Donald Trump, all of a sudden she's like ecstatic. This is embarrassing. Why would you celebrate the endorsement when it's kind of an anti-endorsement? Like he's admitting how selfish he is. He's only supporting Donald Trump because he wants more money. He wants to make more 
than he already has. And he's admitting, though, that black people, they're not better off under Donald Trump. But yet people like Candace Owens, whose entire like goal is to basically do this Blexit thing where you convince black people that Trump isn't that bad and he actually loves them. I mean, it's just, it's astonishing to me. And, you know, they'll point to things like, oh, well, Trump increased funding for HBCUs. Okay, but what has Trump said about reparations? What is Donald Trump doing to fix healthcare disparities when it comes to uh, black Americans and people of color? Police brutality against black Americans. Donald Trump literally would not even admit in interviews, in town halls, that systemic racism is a thing. So, I mean, you can't possibly make the case that Trump is in favor of black people, doesn't hate black people. I think it's obvious that Trump is racist, but the people who have been trying to prove to everyone that Trump isn't racist are now propping up this pseudo endorsement, even if he calls Trump racist, all because it's a celebrity that supports Donald Trump. I mean, these people are all stupid. I <laughs> I don't know what else to say. 50 Cent is uh, a clown. He should be ashamed of himself for caring more about his own wealth than black Americans. Um, Tommy Loren and Candace Owens, you know, the fact that they're so desperate to get more celebrities to support Donald Trump that they'd even prop up an endorsement when the celebrity endorsing Donald Trump says he knows he doesn't like black people. I mean, this shows how stupid American politics has become. It's a joke. So, look, overall, 50 Cent should be um, ashamed of himself. Uh, let me just say, for the record, G-Unit sucks ass. Uh, Olivia's okay, though. And um, actually, Young Buck and Lloyd Banks aren't that bad either. 50 Cent sucks ass. And G-Unit sucks ass because it's a brand associated with him. But this dude is selfish. This dude is an imbecile. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to rich celebrities who only are looking out for themselves. Don't vote for Donald Trump. I, like, I think that his own supporters are going to know this because clearly, like, rooted in this endorsement is this assumption that, oh my god, I got to keep more money. I want to make more money. Dude, you already have millions of dollars. At one point, I think he was a hundred millionaire. Fuck off. Fuck all the way off. You're going to have millions of dollars until the day you die. Fuck off, you absolutely greedy tool. I mean, this is really making the case as to why we need to tax the rich even more because they are so greedy they're willing to throw their own community under a bus so they can have more money. It's just honestly appalling. It's disgusting. <laughs> I don't necessarily think that Democrats are going to pursue court packing. I hope that they prove me wrong. But this is the right course of action. And just the fact that this is something that even the pundit class is contemplating, it does have Republicans scared. And rightfully so. They should be afraid because they should expect Democrats, if they are going to be a competent opposition party, to retaliate because what Republicans are doing is tantamount to court packing. I mean, if you hold open a Supreme Court seat for nearly a year and don't even allow a single hearing, if you rush through a nominee and try to confirm that individual before an election, after saying we don't confirm Supreme Court nominees during an election year, I mean, that's court packing. I don't know what else to call it. It's court packing. It's not court packing in the sense that we expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court, but it still is court packing. You're making sure that the ideological tilt goes in your party's favor. So uh, the Republican Party, they know that uh, there is at least going to be a push from the left in the Democratic Party for court packing, and they're afraid. So they're preparing. They're trying to make it so that way, you know, they can pack the court and then they stop Democrats from packing the court. So as Sung Min Kim of The Washington Post explains, ahead of Judge Amy Coney Barrett's expected confirmation to the Supreme Court in the coming days, a coalition of Senate Republicans is offering proposals intended to prevent Democrats from so-called court packing. The symbolic measures are intended for Republicans to go on the offensive against Democrats as the issue of whether to expand the number of seats on the nine-member Supreme court remains a delicate one in the final days of the presidential and senate campaigns a half dozen senators led by senator ted cruz will unveil the proposals later monday the first is a constitutional amendment which would require support of two-thirds of congress and then ratification by three-fourths of individual states barring the contraction or expansion of the number of seats on the supreme court the second would bar any proposals to change the size of the supreme court from even being considered in the senate unless two-thirds of its members agree 
agree. Make no mistake, if Democrats win the election, they will end the filibuster and pack the Supreme Court, expanding the number of justices to advance their radical political agenda, entrenching their power for generations, and destroying the foundations of our democratic system, Ted Cruz said in a statement describing his proposals. He added, we must take action before Election Day to safeguard the Supreme Court and the constitutional liberties that hang in the balance. Endorsing the measures are three Senate Republicans in competitive contests in November. Senators Tom Tillis, Martha McSally, and Kelly Loeffler, who have warned of court packing should Democrats win the White House and retake the Senate majority in November. So this was expected, but it's funny because they know that what they're doing warrants retaliation. They know that they're in the wrong. They know that what they're doing is going to lead to at least some members of the Democratic Party calling for court packing. The fact that Republicans are even pursuing a constitutional amendment now shows you that they know what they're doing is completely cynical. Completely cynical. Because if this were a legitimate confirmation process, then there would be no discussions about court packing. But they know that they're packing the court. This is basically court packing light, right? And um, it's just, it's hilarious. So here's what I would say. My thinking is, all right, you don't want Democrats to pack the Supreme Court. If I'm Democrats, I'm playing hardball. I'll say, look, we will vow to not expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court. Granted, you have Donald Trump withdraw his nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. You do that, we don't pack the Supreme Court. Then we call it even. Thankfully, AOC expressed the same sentiment as I just did because she tweeted out in response to this plan, is the plan to withdraw Barrett's nomination? Because if not, I've got the world's tiniest violin at the ready. And uh, that's exactly what I want to hear. That's some wholesome trolling that we need to see. Because, you know, what they're trying to do is they're trying to frame talks surrounding court packing as, you know, um, them playing defense and Democrats going on the offensive and, you know, they're saying we're going to retaliate. But understand, it's Democrats who should pack the Supreme Court as a means of retaliating because that's what you're doing. So what they're trying to do is they want to pack the Supreme Court and then impose a constitutional amendment to stop Democrats from further uh, expanding the court. Uh, except that's not going to pass. And what I propose is Democrats go tit for tat, because even if you go tit for tat, you add two justices to, you know, make up for the two that Republicans stole, we'll let them add two more. We go back and forth because here's the way I see it. If Democrats do not pack the Supreme Court, that is 20 to 30 years of nonstop conservative rulings if Amy Coney Bird is in fact confirmed. So even if Democrats choose to add five, six justices to the Supreme Court, Republicans then retaliate. That's still better than what we know will for sure be the case where we have nonstop conservative rulings. If both parties go tit for tat and, you know, keep expanding the number of justices on the Supreme Court, at least there's going to be some periods of time where there will be a liberal majority on the Supreme Court. But if we don't expand the Supreme Court, then that means nonstop conservative rulings. Not acceptable. That means that Roe v. Wade is on the chopping block. Obergfell v. Hodges is on the chopping block. Citizens United and McCutcheon will be expanded with even more cases. I mean, there's so much at stake and we can't afford to be rehashing all of these old battles. So you've got to go tit for tat. But I don't argue that, you know, let them go tit for tat. That's fine. Uh, without making my own case to block Republicans from packing the court as well. Because as I've stated on this show before, Democrats shouldn't just expand the Supreme Court and then uh, wait for Republicans to retaliate when they're the one, when Democrats are the ones who retaliated. What they should do is expand the Supreme Court and then stop Republicans from doing that. How do you do that? Well, you don't do that by, you know, trying to promote some constitutional amendment. That's not going to pass. You're not going to get that ratified. But what you need to do is you stop Republicans from packing the Supreme Court by expanding democracy. Because when we expand democracy in America... The Republican Party is a minority party. That makes it more difficult for them to win. So if they're going to win, they have to appeal to more people if we further enhance our democracy. So what do, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we add more states to the union. We make D.C. a state. We make Puerto Rico a state. And when I say we make Puerto Rico a state, we allow them to determine whether or not they want to join the United States. We try to entice them, perhaps, but we let them ultimately have their say. 
And if both of those states are added to the union, we have 52 states, then guess what? That's four more senators for Democrats. Now, Republicans could get dirty. They could try to add more states to the union themselves. They can try to carve up Texas into multiple states. That's fine. We'll just carve up California into multiple states. Um, they want to make it so that way Democrats can't win after they've expanded the size of the Senate uh, and they do more voter suppression. That's fine. What Democrats do is opt for compulsory voting. So people are now required to vote because we all know when turnout is higher, Democrats win and Republicans lose. Because again, this is a minority party. So our argument is from a place of democracy. We're trying to, yes, technically block Republicans from expanding the Supreme Court and retaliating, but we're not doing it by putting up these barriers, you know, by imposing a constitutional amendment after we get the ideological tilt on the court that we want. No, we just expand democracy. We consolidate our democracy, enfranchise more people, make it so that way more voices are heard, more people have representation. And if you can't win under those circumstances, under a more democratic country, then that's on you. It's on Republicans to win over people in D.C. and people in Puerto Rico or the different states of California that could emerge hypothetically or, you know, to this new uh, block of voters that emerge if we make voting compulsory. So what I say is, of course, you expand the Supreme Court because we don't have a choice. And if it comes down to it, if both parties go tit for tat, that's fine, because that's better than the alternative of 20 to 30 years of nonstop conservative rule. And I know I sound like a broken record. But it cannot be overstated how horrible it would be for another Lochner era, but except this would be, you know, the Lochner era on steroids, where issues that we thought were already solved were having to rehash everything again, all these same fights. You know, the decades it took for LGBTQ people to get rights, we can't just let that be overturned by a rogue Supreme Court, who is, in fact, ideological. So, you know, it's funny that Republicans now are trying to come up with some plan, but their plan is not going to work. A constitutional amendment is not going to pass. You're not going to get three-fourths of states to ratify it. You're not going to make this happen. But our plan actually is more feasible. The plan to expand the union, add two more states, that's something that's easier. So if really they want to go tit for tat, I mean, if Democrats really played their cards right, which I'm assuming they won't, but if they did, Democrats would have the upper hand here. They could expand the number of justices and then they could block Republicans just by making our country more democratic. So if Ted Cruz here, after his party has packed the Supreme Court, wants to play victim and make it seem as if, oh, we have to protect the Constitution and defend ourselves, save it. You are the ones who brought this on yourselves. You're the ones who stole a Supreme Court seat from Obama. You're the ones rushing through a confirmation process right before an election after you said we don't do that. So you're the ones who made your bed. Lie in it and cope. So in what may probably be the least surprising news ever, Joe Biden, the guy who naively claimed that Republicans will all of a sudden have an epiphany once Donald Trump is out of office, who even considered a Republican running mate at one time, or at least said he was open to it, who has repeatedly praised Republicans over and over again, is reportedly considering Republicans for cabinet positions. Now, this isn't shocking news, but it still is extremely infuriating, and it's an idiotic strategy. So according to Politico, Joe Biden's transition team is vetting a handful of Republicans for potential cabinet positions, despite doubts it will win him new support from the right and the risk it will enrage the left. Reaching across the aisle to pick senior members of his administration could shore up Biden's credentials as a unity candidate. Yeah, right. A message he's made a cornerstone of his campaign. Past presidents, including George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, have all done the same. But that tradition died with President Donald Trump, and liberal Democrats are already warning that a Republican pick, even a moderate one, could sow distrust within the party before Biden even takes office. My primary concern is that he involves people in the cabinet who push back against corporate power and support a massive economic stimulus and the broad provision of health care, said David Siegel, the executive director of Demand Progress, a liberal advocacy group. Unfortunately, there are no prominent Republicans I know of who are on board with that agenda. Never 
Nevertheless, one person close to the Biden transition said it remains a priority to have options from different parts of the ideological spectrum for the former vice president to consider. That person and another official familiar with the transition deliberations confirmed to Politico that Biden staffers are analyzing some Republicans' backgrounds and resumes as they compile shortlists of candidates for high-profile cabinet positions. The goal is to have some GOP options among the finalists that Biden would choose from after the election. Among the names being floated for possible Biden cabinet posts are Meg Whitman, the CEO of Quibi and former CEO of eBay, and former Ohio Governor John Kasich, shocker, both of whom spoke at August's Democratic National Convention. Massachusetts GOP Governor Charlie Baker and former Senator Jeff Flake have also been mentioned, as has former Representative Charlie Dent, who resigned from Congress in 2018 and became a lobbyist. Wow. Uh, when asked for comment, a spokesperson for the Biden transition said only that the team is not making any personnel decisions before the November 3rd election, but stressed that diversity of ideology and background is a core value of the transition. Is that so? So are there any socialists that Biden's team is considering? Are there any communists that he's considering? Any anarchists? Because, I mean, if we truly want to capture the entire range of the political spectrum, then surely you would have communists advising you, right? You'd have some individuals who uh, subscribe to modern monetary theory, Stephanie Kelton. Hell, maybe you'd have some pretty uh, prominent progressives, such as Bernie Sanders. I mean, when they say ideological diversity, understand that they're talking about a binary choice between right-wingers and um, far right wingers, Democrats and Republicans. That's what they're talking about. So let's be clear about that. Uh, so first of all, whether or not this story is true, I do believe it because the fact that his team is being coy and they're saying, well, we're considering some Republicans, but I mean, we're considering everyone. Like that's all that we need to know. And this isn't that surprising. So I'm not necessarily going to pick apart whether or not this story is credible. I, I think it's probably uh, pretty uh pretty obvious that biden will be choosing some republicans um at least to be part of his transition team who knows if they'll actually make it into the cabinet but here's the thing biden is 100 percent um delusional he has repeatedly insisted that republicans will have an epiphany we talked about that at the beginning of this segment but after he said that and he got some pushback because people called him naive rightfully so he even doubled down so he genuinely believes or is at least Stupid enough to think that Republicans will warm up to him and Democrats once Trump is out of office. But this is bizarre to me because Joe Biden is part of Obama's administration. They were in power for eight years. And what was their parting gift to you? They literally stole a Supreme Court seat from you. They're trying to jam through another Supreme Court confirmation before the election. They don't want to work with you. It doesn't matter what you propose. It doesn't matter how often you meet them in the middle. The Republican Party is going to obstruct everything that you do, and even if you literally adopt one of their policies, they will reject it because you are bad by definition, by default. So they're not going to accept what you want. If you try to, you know, extend an olive branch, they're going to shoot it down. If Biden wins, this is not going to be because Biden ran a winning campaign. It's because Donald Trump lost. I really felt like Trump going into this election, he had that incumbent advantage. Uh, but had it not been for COVID-19, something that none of us have experienced before, and the subsequent economic crash, I think Trump probably would likely be sailing towards re-election right now. I mean, it really depends. You, you can't really say for sure. But, you know, if Biden ends up becoming the president, it's not going to necessarily be because he won this election. It's going to be because Donald Trump lost this election. Now, that's a distinction without a difference, and I don't think he cares. But look, this is going to be something that we are going to expect from corporate Democrats. They're reaching out to Republicans because I think that ideologically they agree with Republicans on quite a bit. So understand, um, we know exactly what we're getting with Joe Biden. The benefit is that with Obama, he at least pretended to be progressive. And that was troubling because it, it kind of made all of us get a little bit complacent. But with Joe Biden, he's coming in straight up as a republican light -like candidate. So we know uh, we don't give him a chance. We don't wait to see what he's going to do. No, immediately, like if he actually wins this election, his first day in office, he needs to be pushed as hard as we possibly can push him. Now, he's going to resist change from the left. Um, he probably won't be inclined to listen to the left. In fact, I don't think he's going to listen to the left if history, you know, uh, proves right again. But we make his life a living hell if he's elected. 
yes, he is the lesser of two evils. We want Donald Trump to be, to be defeated. We want him to become president because he's the only person that stands between Donald Trump and the White House for another four years. But understand, that doesn't make him an inherently good candidate. And that's what articles like this prove. You don't need to suspend criticism and not be objective just because you're too afraid to like make sure we're not helping Donald Trump. No, we can be realistic. And I think it's actually healthier to be realistic about what voters can expect with Joe Biden. He's going to be a terrible president and he's going to cause lots of damage. But luckily for him, um, less damage than Donald Trump. And I think a lot of people recognize this. So, I mean, this just shows... Um, this isn't going to be, you know, a period of time where you're going to go to brunch. You're going to have to fight the entire time. But still, fighting Biden, obviously, is more preferable than fighting Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump, just like, there's no chance that we can persuade him to do anything. But at least with Joe Biden, you know, maybe, maybe there's a chance that we can at least put enough pressure on him that we can stop him from doing shitty things. Like, I'm not under the delusion that he's going to adopt progressive policies like Medicare for All, but maybe there's a chance, a small chance, that we can stop him from doing the most harmful things that he probably wants to do. And I'll leave that there because I don't want to dwell on this too much. Again, this isn't a shocking story to me, but still, uh, we've got to talk about it because I'm not going to bite my tongue because, you know, uh, Joe Biden is the one person who stands between Donald Trump and another four years. I'm not going to bite my tongue. Um, it's incumbent on him to win people over. And that means you don't be idiotic in your strategy. You don't piss off the people who you need currently for a really small margin of voters who you're not going to win over. So I just found out that Pat Robertson is not only still alive till this day, but he's still on television for whatever reason. Now, I don't want to, you know, propagate any conspiracy theories, but it is entirely possible that he died a long time ago and that a reptilian is controlling his body or a puppeteer is making him move and talk. But either way, he's here on the 700 Club and he is still dishing out some really piping hot takes. And his latest is, uh, it's a doozy. So he claims that God told him who's going to win this election and what will happen subsequently afterwards. Now, what I find interesting about this take is that if God is real, do you honestly think that he cares about, like, an election that's taking place, something that we think is important on this random planet, around this random star, in a random galaxy, in one of what may be infinite universes and infinite timelines? Like, why would God, who's omnipotent and benevolent, give a shit about our election? Like, if he's going to talk to you about anything, like, wouldn't he give you the secrets of the universe? But nonetheless, um, Pat Robertson says God uh, gave him some election spoilers. So this is what he says God told him. There's going to be a war. Ezekiel 38 is going to be uh, the next thing down the line. Then a time of peace. Then maybe the end. But nobody knows the day or the hour when the Lord's going to come back. He said the angels don't know it. And only the Father knows it. So I'm not saying this is the second coming, but I am saying there are things that people have thought <clears throat> would be during a millennial time with the coming of Jesus that are going to happen in our lifetime. And uh, the next thing is the election that's coming up in just a few weeks, at which time, according to what I believe the Lord told me, the president is going to be reelected. I'm, I'm, I'm saying by all means, get out and vote, to, vote for whoever you want to vote for. But by all means, let your voice be heard. But it's going to lead to civil unrest of a great proportion, then a war against Israel and so forth and so on. <laughs> Oh, Pat, 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 Pat. Okay, I don't even know where to begin. Let's just take it from the top. First, he says there's going to be war, then a time of peace, then maybe the end. Okay, so excluding the end, the end times, um, so pretty much like all of history, it's not like wars are some like new phenomenon. They've been happening because humankind is a very flawed species and we haven't evolved to a point where we uh, are not killing ourselves any longer. So, like, he says that as if, oh, well, you know, this is just evidence that the end is near. There's always been wars. Like, they could have said that the end times are near if you think that wars are evidence that Jesus is coming back, like, thousands of years ago, literally. Uh, but here's what he says, um, and then immediately contradicts himself that maybe laugh out loud. 
Uh, so he says, nobody really knows when the end times will actually happen. Not even the angels in heaven knows. But directly after saying that, he goes on to make a prediction as if he knows when. <laughs> Pat, what is wrong with you? It's like he he's talking and there's noise coming out of his mouth, but the words aren't connected to the thoughts in his head. And he's just like babbling incoherently. My dude is fading away. He also says, according to what I believe the Lord told me, the president is going to be reelected. Uh, but then he says, make sure to vote because this election definitely isn't a foregone conclusion. But wait, if, if God literally is saying Trump's going to win then why are you so unsure? Why are you making sure to persuade people to vote? Because regardless of uh, how many people vote for Trump or not, isn't this election a foregone conclusion because God said it? God can make anything happen, right? Is he not omnipotent? So, I mean, even if nobody voted for Donald Trump, if God wanted to, God can make Trump the president, can he not? If God wanted to, I could chop off my arm and he could make it grow back immediately. Can he not? Is God not all-powerful? Okay. He then says, Trump's victory will lead to civil unrest of great proportion. Mm. I think it's going to happen uh, if Trump loses more than anything, but that's possible. He then says, Trump's victory will lead to civil unrest of great proportion. And then he says uh, the most puzzling thing ever. After Trump wins, quote, then a war against Israel and so forth and so on. Wait, so if Donald Trump wins, someone who you all claim is an ally to Israel, if he wins, then we're going to go to war with Israel? Like, is it us that's going to war? Is somebody else in the Middle East going to go to war with Israel? If Trump is president, wouldn't, you know, under your belief, if you believe in Trump and what he stands for, wouldn't he protect Israel? I don't understand what you're saying. See, this is why you don't base your political ideology on biblical teachings, because if you try to make predictions or, you know, give a political analysis based on the Bible, you end up sounding like a stupid person. I mean, I don't mean to be blunt, but it's the truth. You're trying to, like, connect what the Bible says to the real world now, and you can see, like, you have to make a lot of logical leaps that you don't have any evidence for whatsoever. Like, how do we go to war with Israel or how does Israel devolve into war and chaos, you have to explain these things. You can't just say things because the Bible gives you reason to believe something will happen or that, you know, because of what the Bible said, we're in like a certain era in time. Like, you can't just say that. You have to supply us with evidence or even reasoning. Fuck, even cite a Bible quote. I mean, I guess you did cite one there, but like, you're not making any sense because... There has to be so many different things, a series of events that has to happen to lead to what you say will happen. And that's if Donald Trump even wins. Now, you say that God told you, but yet you seem unsure. But if Trump does win, then uh, things are going to get more crazy. There's going to be more chaos and we're going to go to war with Israel. Pat, listen, this comes from a place of love. Um, I take that back. It comes from a place of uh, concern because you're a human being. You've got to wrap it up, buddy. You've got to retire. Listen, folks, even though the MAGA chuds that hate watch this channel um, will tell me that I am suffering from full-on Trump derangement syndrome, and they're probably right, I still can admit with my libtard brain, even though I'm not a liberal, uh, that there's one good thing about Donald Trump. One thing that he did that... I think that most of us in this country will be thankful for to him eternally, in spite of all of the damage that he caused. He single-handedly crushed both the Bush and Clinton dynasties, which was really nice to see. To see him clown on Jeb Bush and shit on George Bush's legacy, call out Hillary Clinton, like all of this was great because those two families were like, stank on shit. They were like cockroaches. They wouldn't go away. They, they just won't get out of the spotlight. And single-handedly, you have this rookie enter politics and just embarrass them thoroughly. And that was great to see. However, in exchange for him crushing uh, two dynasties that we all hate is a new dynasty that is poised to be worse than the Bush and Clinton dynasties, perhaps 
um, combined, depending on how how much longevity this dynasty has. And of course, I'm talking about the Trump dynasty because there is already a plan in place once Trump is out of power because there's going to be a vacuum that Trump leaves when he inevitably leaves office. Now, who knows if that's uh, on November 3rd or maybe it's 2024. Either way, the Trump era will come to an end and there's going to be someone else who wants to fill that space that Trump occupied, right? Maybe it'll be another Republican. Ted Cruz seems to like want to be that edgy outsider now, even though he's an establishment politician. But one individual, or at least a multitude of people who seem to be sure bets, is the Trump children themselves. And it seems like MAGA Cheds are already yearning for that. They very clearly want the Trump family to continue his legacy after he leaves office. And as you can see from this shirt that this boomer is wearing, they would like Ivanka to run. And then after Ivanka, Don Jr., then Eric Trump, then Tiffany, then Baron. I mean, Baron could be an Antifa super soldier. Who knows? But they want him to run. Um, and I know that you've probably seen this image. Your crazy racist uncle on Facebook has probably shared it at least once. And, you know, you're probably going to say, they're just triggering the libs, Mike. They're not serious about this. But they are serious about this. They are serious about this. They want the Trump dynasty to continue on and on and on and on. I mean, if they had their way, they would make America a monarchy. Um, and you don't have to take my word for it. Take their word for it. Because the Telegraph actually asked MAGA chuds at a recent Trump rally, hey, what do you think about Trump Jr. running? They were very, very open to the idea, to say the least. Donald Jr. is on his way to something, something big. And he would have a big base behind him. Pretty. Right here. Well, I think he's definitely got the skills for it. It's all up to him if that's what he wants to do. I mean, I've seen him speak. I, I know him actually personally as, well, personally as well as his father. And he's a very intelligent, bright young man. And I shouldn't see why not. It's all if you have the stomach and you want to go through what he's bothered with. I need him to separate himself from his dad. Yeah. Um, but I definitely would consider any Trump. I think they're all very well educated and I think they're all, um, they have a unique perspective of America. Although they grew up very privileged, I think they've been able to bring themselves down to very common levels. And I think that's what makes them di a dynamic family. Mm -hmm. I think that if he had the same patriotism and enthusiasm that he has right now and that his dad has, I would most certainly support him. And if he stays conservative and if he stays pro-America, uh, then yes, I would support him. Right Do you know who's going to be his campaign, biggest campaign advisor and manager is probably going to be the father. And the good thing about Don uh, Sr. and Don Jr. is they go on the defensive and then counter punch on the offensive. I don't see that his, his uh, the crowds and everything would be diminished in any way. You number one, he's a businessman. He's very pragmatic. He believes that freedom is the way to go, not big government. And that's, that's what it's all about. The reason people come to the United States is because they want freedom. Mm -hmm. They wanted big government. They would stay where they were. They want to have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, right to bear arms, and to make their own futures through their hard work and labor. He has compassion like his father. He could communicate like his father, and he's, he's above everything, he's humble, very humble. There is no attitude, nothing about him like that that would, I would feel comfortable walking up to him. So that video made me lose faith in humanity, because regardless of like what shitty politician is ousted, they're always going to have someone who benefits within their family. Nepotism is something that runs deep in this country. We basically live in an oligarchy. And, you know, you're not just going to defeat Trumpism and Trumpian politics by getting out Donald Trump. You know, that Trump era will persist probably for quite some time after Trump is out of office. And his legacy might just continue on with one of his children. His supporters are down for it. Like, even as someone who supports Bernie Sanders. Let's say Bernie Sanders hypothetically became president and then he served his two terms and then his son Levy Sanders wanted to become president. Even if I agreed with Levy Sanders on the policies and he would continue on Bernie's legacy assuming I didn't hate Bernie Sanders after eight years, which let's be honest, I probably would be dissatisfied because that's the type of person I am. But like, 
even if, let's say, like in a perfect world, Bernie was president and Levy wanted to carry on that legacy, I would be reluctant to support him. I mean, maybe I would, but I would probably opt for someone else who wanted to carry on Bernie's policy legacy other than his son, because I think that political dynasties are a very, very problematic thing for democracy. Like, it shouldn't happen. But they don't see it that way. So one person says he would have a big base behind him, and I think that she's right about that. I think that Trump's base would easily get behind Trump Jr. or Ivanka Trump. It doesn't matter who, as long as they have Trump as their last name, I think that that base would gravitate towards uh, towards Donald Trump, or, uh, towards one of his family members. What I will say is that if somebody has the same politics as Donald Trump, but conducts themselves in a more uh, grown-up manner, they could be much more effective. Like, if Donald Trump wasn't such a blistering buffoon and, like, always so arrogant and never shuts the fuck up, I think he could be a lot more effective. But he he's in over his head. Like, he doesn't know what he's doing. But, like, if you are actually politically savvy and you just, like, have that Trump facade and you try to carry on the Trump legacy... I mean, you could do some damage. And Trump's kids are probably more politically savvy than him. But it's funny, one guy says, I think he's definitely got the skills for it about Trump Jr. Now, what do you mean by that? What skills? Like, what qualifies him to literally be the president of the United States because his last name is Donald Trump? Now, I will admit, like, if given the choice between uh, Trump Jr. or Ivanka and Donald Trump, I think his kids are probably much more smarter than he is, but the bar is really low. Uh, but they don't even care. Like, as long as somebody has Trump as their last name and they're going to do the same thing, same harmful policies, they're going to get behind them. Like, this really proves that it is a cult of personality. Like, how often did you hear one of those chuds talk about policy? There's no policies. One person said that, um, I would definitely consider any Trump just because Trump is their last name. Uh, and one lady says, if he stays conservative... And if he stays pro-American, I would definitely support him. What does that even mean? I mean, of course, he's going to stay conservative, but what does pro-American mean? Like, you have to describe what that means to you. Are you saying that, like, a Democrat isn't pro-American? Like, what does that even fucking mean? That's not a policy prescription. So if you just, like, are a politician and you literally lube up a gun and fuck yourself with it and hump an American flag... Does that constitute you being pro-American? I mean, what's the standards? If your standard is, oh, well, be pro-American, that's so far-reaching and broad and amorphous that that could mean anything. So what they're effectively saying here is, look, I don't give a fuck. I don't care about policy. Hell, Trump's policies probably hurt me directly. But if they have Trump on their last name, I'm going to go for them. And I want one of his uh, family members to carry on this legacy. Uh America, 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 America. You never cease to disappoint me. <laughs> I want to say that, you know, I think these people are maybe on the fringes. And once, once uh, Trump's out of power, you know, nobody else will really be able to truly recapture the magic. But who the fuck knows? I want to show you two separate headlines that, taken together, really put into perspective just how broken our system is. So on October 16th, NBC News reported 8 million Americans slipped into poverty amid coronavirus pandemic, new study says. Researchers looked at the devastating financial effect the pandemic has had on Americans, with Blacks, Latinos, and children fearing the worst. And then just four days later, on October 20th, Common Dreams reported billionaire wealth has surged by $931 billion during seven months of the pandemic economic collapse. Now, before we dive into both of these articles, which we will, I just want to take some time to try to digest this information. This is astonishing, and it doesn't even make sense. It is the hallmark of society in decline. This is peak late stage capitalism. Because theoretically speaking, if we are seeing an unprecedented crisis where we have both a global pandemic 
and an economic depression upon us simultaneously, you'd think that everyone would be affected equally. Because if poor people don't have money, if they have less purchasing power, then theoretically, if that economy functions appropriately, and as it should, then rich people should also be hurt as well. Because if poor people can't buy the things that capitalists produce, then of course, that's going to hurt them as well. But we're not seeing that. So something is off here. Something is really wrong here. And let me assure you, this is not a coincidence. These things are not unrelated. These are related. Capitalists and billionaires are getting richer precisely because the poor are getting poorer. This system is fundamentally broken. And with how bad it is, I don't even know if this is salvageable. Like, how do you even craft structural reforms that fix all of the problems? Like, it would take a really long time to actually do it and get it done. And there's going to be periods where we have reformers and revolutionaries not in power, and the reactionaries will come to power and try to undo, you know, the reforms that the reformists and revolutionaries put in place. So it's like we're playing whack-a-mole, and it just seems like everything is getting worse and worse as time goes on. But let's get to the specifics here, because as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams further explains, over just the past seven months, as millions lost their jobs and health insurance, tens of thousands of small businesses shuttered permanently, and more than 200,000 Americans were killed by the coronavirus, U.S. billionaires saw their combined net worth surge by more than $930 billion, bringing the collective wealth of just 644 people to a staggering $3.88 trillion. That's according to an analysis released Tuesday morning by Americans for Tax Fairness and the Institute for Policy Studies, progressive organizations that have been tracking the explosion of billionaire wealth since the start of coronavirus lockdowns in mid-March. The new analysis shows that the collective wealth of America's billionaires grew by $931 billion, or nearly 33%, between March 18th and October 13th, a period that also saw unprecedented job loss, a nationwide surge in hunger, and a sharp increase in housing insecurity. The groups noted that the jump in billionaire wealth over the past seven months exceeds the size of both Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's so-called skinny COVID-19 relief bill and the estimated two-year budget gaps of all state and local governments, which have been forced to lay off more than a million public sector workers due to revenue shortfalls caused by the coronavirus crisis. Sadly, the Gilded Age is here again, ATF Executive Director Frank Clementi said in a statement, we have extraordinary gains in wealth by a small sliver of the population, while millions suffer, this time from the ravages of the pandemic, much of which could have been avoided. Now, let's try to put this timeline into perspective here. So between March 18th and October 13th, billionaires got a lot wealthier, all while the poorest have been suffering. More and more people have fallen into poverty. Now, the NBC News article by Stephen Sykes explains that even if the CARES Act was imperfect. In fact, I think it was really flawed. It contained a giant corporate giveaway. Even having said that, it did help a little bit. Not much, but, but a little bit. It didn't like stop poverty. You can say, arguably, it postponed people from falling into poverty. But now, if Congress doesn't take action and even do the bare minimum, things are going to get worse. So NBC News explains the number of Americans living in poverty grew by 8 million since May, according to a Columbia University study, which found an increase in poverty rates after early coronavirus relief ended without more to follow. Although the Federal CARES Act, which gave Americans a one-time stimulus check of $1,200 and unemployed workers an extra 600 a week, was successful at offsetting growing poverty rates in the spring, the effects were short-lived. Researchers found in the study published Thursday, after aid diminished towards the end of summer, poverty rates, especially those among minorities and children, rebounded, they said. The CARES Act, despite its flaws, was broadly successful in preventing large increases in poverty, said Zach Perlin, a postdoctoral researcher at Columbia University and one of the study's authors. The federal stimulus saved about 18 million Americans from poverty in April, he said, but as of September, that number is down to 4 million. So a one-time economic relief package can only go so far and we're seeing it wear off and now we're in the situation where who knows if they're going to get it done before the election which means that it's not going to happen until february which means 
that millions of Americans literally will suffer and fall into poverty because Congress is unable to act. It's just honestly, um, it's shocking that our country has responded in this way. And I'm not necessarily shocked at the response. I'm, I'm shocked at the lack of response because what we see, and I've said this before, is a response that you'd expect from a failed state, not a developed country, the richest country in the world. And look, I'm no deficit scold. I subscribe to modern monetary theory, even though admittedly I'm still learning more about it. I'm reading Stephanie Kelton's book right now. Uh, but it's not like we only have, you know, a limited amount of resources. Even if you care about the deficit, you see the ticket right there. Billionaires collectively almost made a trillion dollars more just during this pandemic. Why aren't we taxing that? Why are they able to maximize profits when everyone else is suffering? The only reason why that happens is because our country does not function. Our economic system is set up to do just that. So, you know, when people talk about this story, they're probably going to say, look, capitalism isn't working. Except I would argue it's working exactly as we'd expect it to work. Because when you get towards this late a stage of capitalism, this is exactly what starts to happen. You know, income inequality becomes so unsustainable that society itself begins to collapse. Capitalism starts to eat itself when you have so much resources in the hands of so few people. That's not sustainable at all. So, I mean, I think that the story, it speaks for itself. It is insane that at a time when people are suffering, people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, the billionaire class is getting far richer than they ever had. Like the, the economic crisis has been great for people like Jeff Bezos. How stunning is that? So everyone on the left, myself included, all, you know, have at one point or another made fun of PragerU because they are just so obnoxious. Uh, like a year or two ago, before what seemed like every single YouTube video, you'd see a PragerU ad and it was so annoying. The problem, however, is that even if we're annoyed because we know better, we know that this is just far-right propaganda funded by right-wing oligarchs, most Americans don't know any better. Lots of Americans have been exposed to PragerU, and their videos, unfortunately, are very effective. But this video uh, that we're going to talk about, th this article that we're going to talk about today, it will have you longing for the days where the biggest concern with regard to PragerU was that we saw their ads too much, because now they are trying to outright brainwash your children. They are trying to get PragerU videos taught in schools. Yeah. So as Rebecca Klein of HuffPost reports, an Ohio public school has been giving students extra credit for watching videos from PragerU, a right-wing website that produces clips of talking heads such as Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro discussing conservative viewpoints HuffPost has learned. The PragerU videos with titles such as Build the Wall, Why the Right Was Right, and The Left Ruins Everything were assigned to a 10th grade history class at Mame High School, along with a series of questions about the video Video's most important messages. Wow. The assignment came at the same time that the website has tried to gain further influence in K-12 classrooms. Earlier this month, the organization launched a program directly aimed at parents and educators, complete with study guides with sections such as Conservatives Are the Real Environmentalists and The Ferguson Lie, based on a HuffPost review of the materials. Andrea Cutway, the mother of a 16-year-old student, Avery Lewis, brought the assignment to the attention of Mame City Schools administrators and immediately pulled her daughter out of the class. Mame is about 10 miles southwest of Toledo. Administrators first tried what they deemed a compromise by allowing the student to include videos that reflected views from the other side of the political spectrum. Cutway said, This was her daughter's suggestion, not the school's, Cutway noted. Other students were still instructed to complete the work using the original videos, Cutway said. But after HuffPost reached out to the school about the assignment, it decided to remove the materials from the syllabus. Todd Kramer, superintendent of Mame City Schools, told HuffPost. Other PragerU videos on its website dissect issues in five-minute clips and have titles such as There Is No Gender Wage Gap, how to steal an election, mail-in ballots, and is Islam a religion of peace? The teacher's class website shows that she also assigned the videos last year. 
The homework assignment appeared unrelated to PragerU's latest venture, called PragerU Educators and Parents, or PREP, which launched several weeks ago. The inception of such a program suggested that these types of assignments may become more prevalent in schools. Already 2,000 parents and educators have already signed up for PREP, Craig Strazeri, Chief Marketing Officer of PragerU, said in an email to HuffPost. So the one incident where, you know, you have a single teacher teaching this garbage, you know, that to me, it's worrying, but it's far less problematic than this prep initiative where PragerU actively tries to get their far-right propaganda taught in schools. And 2,000 parents and educators have already signed up. That doesn't necessarily mean that like 2,000 different classrooms will have this, but still, the fact that there's any interest in this is worrying because it shows you what the right wants to do. They know that if all things as they stand currently don't change, regardless if they like it or not, the future is progressive because millennials, Gen Zers, I mean, these are generations that are far more diverse, far more tolerant, far more progressive, and much more open to socialism. So if they just let this generation, you know, uh, flourish and grow and come to power, they will change things in this country. They will change the status quo eventually. It's inevitable as it stands now, but they want to stop that. So rather than just basically accepting that the future is likely going to be left-wing social democracy, they're trying to brainwash children at an early age. Now, we're already seeing Turning Point USA attempt to try to like push back on what they see as liberal indoctrination at colleges because they often complain that, you know, these college campuses across the country, these are just like liberal breeding grounds. They're safe spaces and you can go into college as a conservative and come out as a bleeding heart liberal or a socialist or even a communist. And they want to stop that with with Turning Point USA. But with PragerU and their prep thing that they're offering, whatever you want to call it, a service, a, a strategy, I don't know. But with this, they're trying to appeal to a younger demographic, K through 12, where they're teaching possibly elementary students about right-wing propaganda, lying to them, indoctrinating them. And let me tell you, what they can do if they're successful with this strategy is far more damage to the country long-term than even Fox News has done to this country to brainwash Americans. And that is absolutely horrifying and it may be an early thing that they just launched with only 2,000 people signing up but when you have virtually unlimited resources at your disposal and lots of right-wing investors who want to fund this project because they know down the road they're going to have to convince young people that capitalism is great and you know uh, they deserve more tax cuts this could be really really troubling so here's what I would tell you uh, that you need to do if you want to counter this support the Gravel Institute because this is the only organization that is attacking PragerU's influence head on. The Gravel Institute is trying to undo the damage caused by PragerU because PragerU videos are actually incredibly far-reaching. Like just in my own social circles, I was arguing with my idiot cousin um, about politics. Um, he's a MAGA chud and um, we were talking about socialism and one of his idiotic friends jumped in and tried to educate me about socialism by sharing a PragerU video. Not just one, but multiple PragerU videos. And whatever I said about capitalism and socialism, they had like a PragerU video to respond. Like they already anticipated the arguments at PragerU. And like, you don't even, if you're a right winger, you don't even have to grapple with the arguments that your opponent is making in a debate like this. Like you just have to copy and paste the link to one of their videos and they do the thinking for you. So, like, it's become such a common phenomenon that I'm seeing normies bring up PragerU. And that really shows, I mean, this is anecdotal evidence, of course, but it shows the wide reach that PragerU has. I mean, we see that Turning Point USA has been relatively dominant. Um, I don't know the overall effect that they've had, but PragerU has had an effect. And if they actually are able to infiltrate schools and indoctrinate and basically brainwash young children at a young age, that would be terrible. 
So we have another CNN voter panel with Alison Camerota that I want to take a look at. I always find these super fascinating, even if it's a really small sample size. I do think that it gives us a nice snapshot as to what some voters are thinking, at least like what the normies are thinking in terms of politics, for lack of a better word. Um, now, I haven't seen this one. This is, uh, I guess it's from late September, I want to say, maybe mid-September. So it's a little bit outdated. Nonetheless, I do want to know what these voters are thinking in terms of, you know, Biden, Trump, third parties, where their heads are at, because I think that these types of um, conversations are important because as leftists, it helps us determine how to talk to people, helps us get out of our bubbles, helps us, you know, craft a message that is tailored to people who aren't glued to politics nonstop, like uh, you or myself. Uh, I haven't seen this yet, so we're going into this blind. I've skimmed it, but for the most part, I don't know what to expect. Um, if you've seen any of my previous videos where I talk about these voter panels, uh, basically every single one of them, with the exception of like one or two, has completely demolished my faith in humanity, so I'm hoping this one won't actually crush my spirit that much. Nonetheless, I'm hoping for the best, but fully expecting the worst. So uh, take it away, Allison. Just tell me, what is the issue that is, is driving you to the polls um, in November? Quite frankly, um tired of turning on the news and watching people look like me being slaughtered for sport. Yeah, I really that makes am sense. Just at the point now where I don't, I don't want to have to keep explaining to my kids like why they have to move differently because of the color of their skin. My son is 14 and I fear for my son sometimes because, you know, just because of the way he looks. And that should not be a reality in 2020, but here we are. I'm just ready for somebody to actually, like, do what they say they're going to do. And you don't think that that's President Trump? Absolutely not. No. My top issue... I mean, yeah. I think that what she's saying is perfectly valid and reasonable. Um, yeah, this is this is something that you know, you'd hope to hear something that really is a huge issue. Like, you want to hear the things that we talk about on this program. You know, you want to, you want to hear from other people who aren't glued to politics. Yeah, these things are important to me. You know, you're not missing the mark or misreading the room. So, I mean, what she said there, how does that not resonate with you? You know, she has a 14-year-old son, and she's literally concerned that he'll be murdered extrajudicially, that's a difficult word, by the police. I mean, that that's heartbreaking. That's so heartbreaking. This might crush my soul, but like in a different way, because it's just, that really is, you know, a terrible thing that nobody should have to deal with. Uh, it's similar to the young lady right before me. I'm tired of seeing uh, this country racially divided. Um, we haven't de dealt with the original sin Which of this Trump country. Trump makes worse. Um, and I think that if we don't start to deal with that, uh, we're going to have a bigger problem on our hands. And I think that uh, uh, President Trump has proven that he's not the man to deal with that, yep. uh, those issues. And we see that our country is in tor turmoil. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm betting that uh, we are going to be able to make some headway uh, with uh, candidate Biden. My top issue is... I mean, I'm not holding my breath, but like, it, what they're saying, it's valid. I mean, how could you not be exhausted? How could you not, like, be tired of the divisiveness that Trump sows in society? Like, his policies in practice aren't that different from other Republicans, but the impact that he has on culture is outsized, you know, compared to other Republicans. The way that he's able to pit Americans against each other, it's almost like he, he's an expert at doing that. So, I mean, what they're saying is 100% valid, and I, I totally uh, sympathize with them. Uh, it's, it's, I want to return to some kind of status quo. It is great yeah. to renegotiate some uh, trade deals that I don't think were right. But, hey, if you frame that on the chaos and racial division that we're living today, I don't want it. I'm going to respond a little differently. Uh, that guy kind of reminds me of one of the um, centrist voters, and I'm maybe like 
reading way into this and overgeneralizing, but like one of the centrist voters who would be protesting at the women's march with a sign that says if Hillary won, we'd be out to brunch because he wants to see a return to the status quo. Or maybe like he was anti-establishment back in 2016, but he saw that, you know, the anti-establishment choice that ended up winning made people long for the days of what they perceived to be normality. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I would want to press him further on that if I were Alison Camerota. Maybe she did, but they didn't play it. But um, yeah, so far, I mean, this is all reasonable to me so far. From the guests, um, I think the president is making every effort uh, to do his best for people of color and people that are not of color. We can help the current president um, make things better for all of us. So what? I just think that the president is bringing us together because what wait wait you just said that the president is bringing us together even if you are the biggest maga chud kool-aid drinker ever there's no way you believe that he's bringing people together like even trump supporters that have been in these panels before they admit okay i get that like he's not like your usual politician and he's a little bit bombastic and you know he can be dis divisive at times but look at the end of the day he cares about people this dude is like convinced himself of what he wants to believe like you're not even living in reality and you're saying that Trump is trying to bring people together? Like, th this is like one of those people that I was telling you about that are just too far gone. You're not ever going to win him over. If he literally thinks that Trump is bringing people together, too far gone. Straight up stupid. And when I go to those events, I feel comfortable. I don't feel threatened. You, you feel comfortable at Trump events with other Trump supporters where you're all in the same like bubble and agreement. Of course you're going to feel like comfortable with other people and you're probably going to feel like more welcomed at Trump rallies because Trump doesn't have a lot of voters of color who support him. He's performing very poorly against uh, with black people among black people. So like whenever there's like black people at his rallies, he tries to get them like directly behind him. So that way it makes it seem like he has more black support than he does in actuality. So when they see you there, they probably welcome you with open arms because they're trying to, you know, fight this narrative that Trump is uh, racist and can't attract black voters. And it's not even narrative, like it's it's just the truth, but that's why you probably feel more welcomed. But I mean, even if that isn't the case, you're of course going to feel welcome with people you agree with more. Like, obviously, that's not evidence that Trump is bringing people together. Oh my God, you're so stupid. And, and, and basically what he's saying is that, you know, let's make our country that we all live in great. And that's including everyone. I think he's oh, doing okay. a, a- Oh, I gotta take a moment to try to digest that. Trump is uh, trying to bring people together. He's including everyone. Trump is being inclusive. Holy shit. That, that is probably going to be the dum-dum of, uh, of the panel. There's always like one idiot that they bring on just to like fuck with people, to entertain us. They always find some person that's like a psychopath. Like on the last panel, uh, there was a Trump supporter. She, I think she's the president of Latinos for Trump. I'm going to blank on her name. But she was like this weird like loud anti-masker who claimed that she has a medical problem she can't wear masks she was insane like i don't think that guy's as bad uh this guy however i will say that like he's probably the stupid person of the uh of the panel but we'll see we haven't heard from the other two which i'm assuming are trump supporters phenomenal job and um i'm he has my vote absolutely absolutely but what part is he doing a phenomenal job on that yeah he what's the fights for my rights so i can most definitely make my own decisions that's my number one thing like uh so what rights in particular you can make your own decision um your rights as a woman with regard to like your own bodily autonomy is are you saying that he's fighting for your rights there <laughs> I don't believe this, like, at all, just so you know. I mean, he gassed peaceful protesters, his attorney general did for a photo op. Is he really fighting for rights, or is that just what Fox News and OAN is telling you to believe? I feel like um, in what living issue? here in California, a lot of things have been stripped. Oh, she's, she's in California, so it doesn't matter. A lot of my rights have been stripped, for instance, like about the masks. Uh, you know, of course, oh, yeah. Oh, no. She's an anti-masker. Oh, they're the dumbest of all of Trump supporters. Oh, I was hoping that there wouldn't be one on this panel. Oh, fuck my life. She wear a mask, and why isn't he wearing a mask? Oh, well, wait, wait, hang on. Is she criticizing Trump now for not wearing a mask? Okay, I'll I'll eat crow. I'll, I'll admit that I was wrong. I make my own decisions. That's my number one thing. Like, I feel like um, in what living issue? here in California, a lot of things have been stripped 
a lot of my rights have been stripped, for instance, like about the masks. Uh, <laughs> of course, yeah, you should wear a mask. And why isn't he wearing a mask? Well, that's his that's his opinion, right? Isn't that his 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 choice? Lady, what the fuck? Are you saying? Oh my god. So like she makes the uh he's fighting for my liberty argument and the example she uses is masks. But simultaneously, she's you know, she wants him to wear a mask. But at the same time, if he doesn't, that's his liberty. Except this is a pandemic and a virus doesn't know about liberty. It doesn't have like a party affiliation. It's not like you exercising your liberty if you're a dumbass and you don't wear a mask because guess what? Liberty for you ends at your neighbor's nose. Like the right you have, like the freedom to swing your fist ends before it hits your neighbor's nose. And that extends to masks. So you aren't like making a choice individually uh, to not wear masks that only affects you. Like if you don't wear a mask, you're spreading your disgusting germs on everyone else. By you not wearing a mask, you are infringing on other people's liberties by potentially exposing them to a very contagious, deadly disease right now that we're all trying to fight. So the liberty argument is not applicable to this conversation. And by trying to use it, it shows how stupid and naive and gullible, quite frankly, you are. And if you think that Trump should wear a mask more, like, why are you making the liberty argument? Like, this is basically what Trump said, right? Trump, in his interview with Chris Wallace, if I'm remembering correctly, he said he likes masks, but he doesn't want a national mask mandate because he thinks people should have the right. Again, like, you having the right to not wear a mask, you infringe on other people's rights and liberties to not want to contract COVID fucking 19. So anyone who makes this argument, like, they have shit for brains and they are literally stupid if they think this. Like, you are so fucking stupid. You're so far gone. You're irredeemable. Like, who believes this? Like, Americans just believe everything is my rights. So if you go to, like, fucking McDonald's and you ask for a milkshake and the machine is down... You literally think that, like, your civil liberties have been violated. That That's like, the way that Americans have been, uh, you know, uh, led to believe that they, they're entitled to everything. My liberty, my freedom. When it's it's not. Like, this isn't that complicated. I don't know why you're overcomplicating it. But I, I need to shut the fuck up and let her talk. Um, though you wear a mask because you're conscientious about your neighbors, you want the freedom to not wear a mask? Um, Yeah. <laughs> Allison, <laughs> Allison, like her head is gonna explode. Let me go back. Let me watch her reaction. <laughs> this this reaction right there says it all. Like her eyes are about to roll back into her head. She like is trying to process the stupidity that she's hearing about your neighbors. You want the freedom to not wear a mask? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I want. I don't want it because I'm be fucking such like stupid. A, like um you have to and it's like a bad thing if you don't it's a pandemic dumbass oh my fucking god people it's not like we're asking people to fucking like do something so inconvenient you're just asked to put a fucking piece of cloth on your goddamn face like the anti-mask stuff like anyone who's anti-mask i just immediately assume that they're like the stupidest in America, like the the lowest of the low in terms of stupidity, because that, I mean, honestly, I don't know what to say. I'm repeating myself because I'm just going to rant on this lady. She's the dumbest. I take it back. I apologize to the weird glasses guy. This lady is definitely the dumbest. Um, Even this guy who's probably a Trump supporter knows she's a dumbass. Okay, Dan, your top issue. I think my top issue Go ahead, really Dan. is about the economy, specifically my economy and my state. Because, you know, I look at what, what Biden's proposing on the, the tax increases on the wealthy. It's I'll just stop him right there. I'm guessing that this guy who saw Biden's tax plan doesn't know what a marginal tax rate is. He thinks that his taxes will be taxed at 62%, not knowing that it doesn't apply to him most likely unless he makes over $400,000 per year. But Biden's tax plan kicks into effect on your 400 and uh, first thousand dollar uh, i just fucked up that number but after you make four hundred thousand dollars every dollar after that is taxed at 62 percent. but like people don't get taxes either they're purposefully obtuse or they they think they're going to be rich someday unless this guy's actually rich then i'd say okay well i mean at least that makes sense logically but let's let's hear him out first before i uh, blab on 
It's all about soaking the rich. You know, I don't, there are a lot of things Good. I don't like about Trump. I mean, I wish I could cut off his thumbs and he would stop tweeting and it would just be quiet. But <sighs> you know, the truth of the matter is, policy wise, he's not done that bad. And if we want to fix racial injustice in this country, one of the best things, the foundation, is fix the economy. And I think we have a better chance of doing that going forward than with Joe Biden. Okay. Basically, he's admitting that, you know, Trump, in terms of Republicans, he isn't that bad. If he didn't do the mean tweets, he'd basically be perfect. But he's basically making a class reductionist argument that, hey, everyone, if, you know, everyone's material conditions were met, everything would be copacetic. There'd be, you know, no racial injustice. Now, the economic desperation certainly does lead to more racism. It exacerbates the problem. But hypothetically speaking, let's say that uh, the economy was doing better. Purchasing power was up. Black Americans actually had wealth. Would that lead to less racism in America? Would racism go away? No. Now, maybe if, you know, we pressed upon this, he'd make, you know, a more nuanced argument. Um, but basically, you can't just say, oh, well, you, you only exclusively focus on the economy and then racism itself will get better. You can't, like, these things are inextricably linked. You have to fight them simultaneously. You can't just pretend like only addressing... Uh, the economic issues is going to lead to racism going away because that's not the way that it works. You know, this whole war in the suburbs saying that Joe Biden's talking about, we're already kind of seeing that. Joe Biden's not talking about that. Trump is talking about suburbs? that. I mean, are you listening? Yeah. What has Joe Biden said that is a war on the suburbs? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, if you go even on his website, you go through and read the policies, right? He hasn't even um, read the policies. Like the Home Act. There are some there are some things in the bottom of that with respect to local zoning, like basically taking control of local zoning and saying, well, you can't do it because if you have local zoning, then you're you're excluding everybody. And it's a the suburban shit is basically let's call it what it is. It's a dog whistle. It's a racist dog whistle that Trump uses. He's speaking directly to white suburban voters when he talks about this shit. And the fact that this guy fell for it is kind of embarrassing. Very heavy headed approach to taking over local politics. That's the way I view it. Any of you motivated by what's happening with the Supreme Court? Show of hands. Okay, so four of you. That is, you had your hand up first. What do you see? I see hypocrisy. Um, I see, you know, the Republican Congress is basically uh, doing everything they, they said they wouldn't do. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, this is too fast to put, to put someone in the seat. Um, the American people aren't going to get a say in it. It's basically going to be a rush job. Has it made you more motivated? Um, I think that it definitely made me change my local vote in my Senate race here. How so? Previously, uh, I was considering uh, possibly voting for Lindsey Graham. And why were you going to vote what? for Lindsey Graham? He has done some things with the uh, with the ports here in Charleston, uh, creating you know some some jobs. Um, here in South so Carolina. So pork. I, I'm very, Whoever you uh, get is going to give you pork I mean, that's, if that's, that's what you're what concerned with, my jobs. dude. But it, this this fella is just not a man of his word. Okay. It's a weird election year. I mean, it just feels like everybody is, like, doing the absolute most to try to, like, push through whatever it is that they want to happen. And it's not always in our favor, I feel like, so. I agree. I see a lot of hypocrisy. Uh, I see them. I, I remember very vividly what happened in 2016 when Scalia died. Uh, and I remember the comments of all the... And, and uh, to, to some extent, I, I agree with them. At that point, now they are all turning around on their... pivoting on their own position to their favor. There's a lot of hypocrisy. That's interesting because I wasn't sure that, like, the normies would remember the 2016 thing, but he kind of agreed with Republicans and now that they're, you know, violating what they said, I, that is having an effect. This guy's voting for Biden in Florida. That's that's really interesting because I, I felt like, you know, the GOP, they can be as hypocritical as they want to be and never have to worry about losing voters so long as they pander uh, when it comes to cultural issues, you know, uh, abortion, for example, and the Supreme Court. So that's interesting that it actually is hurting them, their hypocrisy, at least like with this sample of people on both sides right now unfortunately you know you you're gonna both sides of this really dude 
You're going to both sides this. He's like a Trump supporter that's kind of like an enlightened centrist who, back in 2016, was really enthusiastic about John Kasich, but, you know, he begrudgingly voted for Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, if Donald Trump just, you know, didn't do these mean tweets, I don't like this guy. Like, I don't know who I hate more because this guy's like the enlightened centrist and he should know better. I don't know. I don't know. This has come around many times. It happened in 2016. And at that time, Obama appointed somebody, which he should have. And the Senate should should have given uh, Garland a hearing. But they didn't. I do hope they appoint somebody to the to the bench who is not an activist either way and who believes in the precedent Good of luck. law. And as we move forward, that you know, we need to get that in place as soon as we can. Good That's luck, reasonable. bud. Good luck. Is that it? That's it. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know how long this video is by now. But uh, look, I'll be honest, that wasn't the worst. Um, there's been far stupider people. It's just, it's interesting to see where the average voter is because, you know, we're, call, we're, we're all kind of in our bubbles, right? Like, if you're online and you're a leftist, like, you're always hearing people kind of reinforcing your own opinion. And I'm sure that the same is true to an extent on the right. So it's nice to hear from people who aren't always hyper engaged in politics. And it's nice to know that, you know, the things that happen, like blatant hypocrisy with Republicans and the Supreme Court, it does have an effect. It is hurting them. I mean, this guy, he was going to support Lindsey Graham just because of the pork barrel projects that Lindsey Graham produces for South Carolina. But Lindsey Graham's hypocrisy ended up uh, hurting him with this voter. That's interesting. Uh, same with this guy, too. Um, so, yeah, this is really interesting. The anti-mask lady uh, really got under my skin. I think she's probably the worst here. Uh, having said that, though... Um, <laughs> That's my thoughts. I don't know if we'll have another voter panel before the election, but if so, uh, I will enthusiastically cover it because I do think these are entertaining, even if sometimes they can be a little bit uh, soul-crushing. So a CNN reporter showed up to a QAnon rally for educational purposes, I am assuming, and we are going to watch to see uh, what happened because I think that this new group, as it gains prominence, is something that we all should focus on because, like, I don't know what happens in this video because I haven't seen it yet, but what I do know is that based on like other videos where reporters have gone to QAnon events, they are absolutely unhinged and deranged and the line between reality and um, delusions is it's obscured. Like these people are unhinged and I know that there is multiple branches to QAnon to an extent, uh, but most of them believe that. Donald Trump, of all people, who have been who has been accused of sexual assault by multiple women, apparently he is the one who's finally cracking down on all of these covert pedophile rings that exist in Hollywood and Washington, D.C. And it's only the Democrats who are pedophiles, apparently. No Republicans, um, even though Donald Trump was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. According to these people, he's the savior. Now, what's interesting, before we watch the video, um, as the insider reports here... QAnon followers say Trump is a savior for trafficked children, but the Justice Department has gone after fewer cases on his watch. So even if Donald Trump was cracking down on pedophilia and child sex trafficking at a higher rate, you know, that wouldn't be enough evidence to suggest that he is like the savior here. Uh, but even like the bare minimum that you'd hope to confirm this conspiracy theory is not there. It's not accurate. Um, according to believers of the QAnon conspiracy theory, President Donald Trump is the country's savior from liberal elites who are kidnapping children and running secret sex trafficking uh, rings. But data shows that federal sex trafficking prosecutions have actually decreased since Trump took office. According to the Human Trafficking Institute's 2019 federal report, which was released in May 2020, 73 new federal criminal cases involving the sex trafficking of children only were prosecuted last year compared to 87 in 2018 and 124 in 2017, Trump's first year in office. Experts say QAnon believers are latching on to misinformation to boost their cause, but ignore evidence-based solutions to the issue. So, I mean, like, prosecutions for these cases have de decreased over the years, but, like, it seems as if the way that they frame this, we're about to see, like, the logical conclusion to all of this, and Donald Trump is going to finally crack down on all of them, and, you know, masks will come off, and everyone will be exposed. It just, these people are batshit insane. So, we're gonna watch. And, um, I'll, I'll share my thoughts as we, we see this. Pain is coming. 
the fact that you guys are attacking us and making us look like we're crazy when we're just trying to save some fucking children pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Already. If you want... <laughs> I have to comment on this. If you want people to think that you're not crazy, then you have to, at a minimum, at least while the cameras are on, not act crazy. Like, that guy probably shitting himself. Like, this lady is scary. Like, how could you not be afraid? Um, That's just, that's terrifying. I don't care who you are. That's just scary. When people, like, start acting like that, where they have to convince you that they're not fucking crazy, like, they're probably crazy. I'm sorry. We're just trying to save some children pisses me off we're just trying to save some fucking children um so don't get in our way okay the real pandemic is child you trafficking have seen people sharing the hashtag save, save the, children the children or save our children Hang on. over the past few the hashtag that they're using is really interesting because these are all donald trump supporters they've all drank in the kool-aid uh drank the kool-aid they're all maga chuds but it's interesting because Donald Trump, the president who they worship, is bombing children in the Middle East and North Africa. His first raid that he greenlit in Yemen led to the death of, what was it, a six, seven-year-old, Nawar al-Awlaki? And when it comes to healthcare, what is Trump doing? We had to fight Republicans to get them to renew the children's health insurance program. Dreamers. I mean, everything that Trump has said, his entire ideology, openly has been fuck them kids and yet they're saying save the children and they think that trump is a savior like this mindset is so weird like these people do not live in reality they've made up their own reality like the world that they fabricated is not one that we're all living in and they're living in their own like little bubble and it's super culty like this is a cult within a cult because you have donald trump supporters who are definitely a cult like the diehards and then within that cult you have people who are even further entrenched in this weird cult bubble like Trump has really brought out, like, the craziest elements in American society. It, it's just, I don't know if they've always, I'm sure they've always been there, but are just, like, more vocal now. But this is just bizarre. On social media. But much of this online activity has nothing to do with the respected and real Save the Children charity, which has been around for more mm, than so 100 they years. It. Its name, Save the Children, has been hijacked by followers of the mm. QAnon conspiracy theory. In a statement, the charity has emphasized they have not don't to tread do on me with this movement. I love how people with that um, "don't tread on me" flag, they basically are against big government, that vague notion. But really, what they're asking for is, you know, not for big government to tread on us, but for large multinational corporations to tread on us. If if I were an alien that landed down from Mars. How would you explain to me what QAnon is? So QAnon is just a way for Trump supporters to look at what Trump is doing and say, this doesn't match what I want. I thought he was going to kick out literally every illegal immigrant. I thought he was going to lock her up. So basically, like, it's cognitive dissonance. Is that what it is? A way that they've convinced themselves that Trump is still good? I guess that explains it. That's interesting. That stuff's not happening. Why? They view it as, okay, Trump won the election, but Trump's not in control of the government. Actually, the deep state is. Yeah, I'm supposed to be the dragon and the cute butterfly there, about to get eaten, hopefully. <laughs> okay, I just have to comment. That dog is so adorable. Um, What a good boy, just sitting there not barking, just like chilling. The website that helped spread QAnon and Pizzagate. He left the site a few years oh, ago. Oh, so and Pizzagate is connected, it. of course. So Save More the lunacy. Children is, is sort of a, a gateway, a soft front into QAnon. Correct, yes. Because I've spoken to people That's who interesting. Organize... That's really interesting because like, if you just say save the children and you vocalize how you're against human sex trafficking and, you know, uh, pedophilia, nobody's going to disagree with that. So if somebody like buys into that very obvious premise, every reasonable person wants to save children and is against pedophilia, you can see how they get like roped in. Like this guy is really explaining how people are getting duped. Well-meaning people who want to protect children, rightfully so, are getting, you know, um, conned to believe this. It's This is interesting. And they're adamant. They say, 
I'm not a QAnon believer. That's ridiculous. I mean, just go to the event, right? And talk to people there and see what they believe in. So you're a QAnon follower? 100%. Got it. Talk about it. Why aren't you talking about it? Why are we not talking about all the kids that are going missing? Why? That makes me question you. You're on camera right now, my dude. Talk about it. <laughs> this dude has a survivor buff. That's interesting. Scotty the Kid, a singer and activist, has been organizing Scotty these the protests Kid. I've never in heard of him. Much like how they've co-opted the name Save the Children, they have also seized on and are distracting from the very real and serious issue of missing and exploited children. Much of their focus instead is on conspiracy theories about Hollywood stars and Democrats. So there's no Republicans? Like, I want them to be asked, how do you reconcile the fact that the savior of children was friends with Jeffrey Epstein, who had a literal island that he raped children on. Like, how, how do they, like, not think that Donald Trump is part of the problem? It's just such a weird, bizarre way to look at the world. Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. It's like, do they just pretend like that's fake and Trump was never friends with Jeffrey Epstein? Like, they need to, they need to explain this. Do you, um, do you follow QAnon? The FBI says it's a dangerous conspiracy theory. Do I follow? No, I don't follow. I don't know what... It looks like you drank, like, a ton of Kool-Aid and were, like, super sloppy. I don't know if you think that's effective, but you look kind of stupid right now. You know, I follow the missing children. I have a child right now in Ohio that my team is saving. That's what I want to talk about. But Not a conspiracy. You posted, about Q no you posted about QAnon yesterday, right? On your Instagram uh, story? <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, bitch! bitch. So your mom watches CNN? Yes. So if your mom watches CNN, she's probably seen people like me on TV saying Pizzagate's a conspiracy theory. Mm. You don't believe it's a conspiracy theory? No, it's definitely not. Pizza <laughs> no. is a code word for child pornography. Cheese pizza, child pornography. And they believe that. No. They Wait. Cheese pizza? <laughs> Wait, because C P O. <laughs> They're nuts. <laughs> okay, well, can't you apply that to Donald Trump? Donald Trump, DP, definitely pedophile. Gotcha, bitch. That's not evidence. Oh, Jesus Christ. I believe Hillary Clinton is a pedophile. They believe almost every high Democrat is a pedophile. Podesta, all of them. It's crazy. What, what's going on with Tom Hanks? <laughs> There's a lot of people who are pedophiles. Beyonce Knowles is a pedophile as well. Wow. So basically everyone in Hollywood is a pedophile. Like all of them are pedophiles. Interesting. Sure, Jan. Pedo would. Interesting. They literally just believe that like everyone who's a Democrat is a pedophile. If they're in Hollywood, but they're like conservatives, uh, like Kevin Sorbo, who's a conservative, I guess he's not a pedophile. This shit doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, even for conspiracy theory, I, I get how people get roped into it because it's based off of, like, a real issue. Um, so they get roped into it. But then all they do is make these really huge assumptions about other people with zero evidence. Like, the jumps that they make, there's not enough evidence to go from point A to point B. So, like, they start at an issue that's serious and then they very easily cross over into fucking Cuckooville. And it's just, it, how did they make that jump? That's one thing that I still don't understand. Because like, oh, cheese pizza, child por pornography. Like, that's not enough evidence. How is that persuasive to you? You could literally take any fucking acronym and make it into something nefarious. But that's not evidence. So you guys just want me to explain everything today, huh? Yeah, Dude, bitch, you're there. Suspicion. That's that's suspicion. How do you know that Tom Hanks says How do you not know? <laughs> Why can't you prove a negative? Fucking fake news. Prove a negative. Prove that Tom Hanks isn't a pedophile. You can't. Gotcha. Proving a negative. non fact. Because you, do you don't know the information, you're saying it's but a neither, fact that they're not. But neither do you. We're in an impasse then, because we're reporting literally the same thing. But neither do you. But you have him on your sign. You're calling him a pedophile. Yes. But you don't. Prove that you're not a pedophile. How do we know that you're not like a fucking plant from the deep state? How do they get to that position of power? 
save the children is a good message. Everyone wants to save the children. So they were putting this veneer of legitimacy on the Q stuff and the idea that there's a deep state cabal. Going online and doing these kind of performative demonstrations where your real target is political, not any actual abuse, you know, you're not helping any child by doing that. Children going missing, those numbers, they're out there, they're legit. I guess the disconnect that I see, and I think maybe your mom might agree with me, <laughs> she's watching this on CNN, is that, you know, this is a real problem, but then there's all this stuff online that seems, as your mom might say, a bit crazy. Well, what we're saying is crazy is the Satanists who are hurting children. Not the Satanists. Okay, I was curious because... Like, I know that there are parts of uh, QAnon that believe that these aren't just pedophiles, like they're Satanists. Um, but on top of, like, being pedophiles, they drink the blood of children. And I don't know, like, if that's all QAnon people, but certainly a large portion of them believe that. It's just batshit fucking insane. The people who are trying to expose it and save us. Uh, yeah, so that was about what I expected. Um, there's just, there's no evidence. They take an actual issue and they extrapolate. You know, they uh, bring up these inferences and implications and they think, well, this is a real issue. So Tom Hanks is probably a pedophile. Like <laughs> they make a lot of logical leaps that they don't have evidence for and it just comes off as very weird. I kind of want to check out some of these comments just to see what people are saying. So absolutely no evidence uh, people are saying. Donald Trump, yeah, that's true. Many people are saying. Uh, and what if what QAnon is saying is true, why do they get so angry whenever someone questions them about it? They don't want to be challenged on it? Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Uh, imagine being in your history lesson back at school. Teacher, Michael, who started the Second Civil War. Uh, Michael, Char uh, Charlie Wonka, prove me he... Prove to me that he did not. Yeah, I mean, people, thankfully, seem pretty reasonable in the comment section, which is something that you don't usually see from YouTube. It's usually nothing but, like, toxic uh, bullshit. But, yeah, I mean, this is scary only because, like, it's no longer this fringe element of society. Like, it's growing and it's becoming more prominent. And now we actually have people who will be members of Congress who are part of this, I don't know what you want to call it, a movement? Marjorie Taylor Greene. So it's sad because like Americans and humanity in general, we have access to more information than ever before at our fingertips with our phones. And yet we buy into more bullshit rather than seeking out new information. We find like these weird conspiracies to latch onto because they give our lives meaning or something. It's just, it's sad. It's really sad. And I wonder what will happen to the QAnon group once Donald Trump is out of power. It's interesting. Um, We'll have to wait and see, I guess. Well, that's all that I've got on the agenda for today's program. I hope you all enjoyed that. Before we go, of course, I want to thank all of our latest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which helped us uh, to grow and are helping us not just to survive, but thrive. I mean, truly, you all are just, you are the definition of comrades. And I truly, uh, I just... I love you all so much. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I I've run out of steam. I don't have anything else to talk about. So we're going to end the show right there. Um, next week is the last episode before the election. And it's bittersweet because on one hand, I want it to be over because, oh my God, this election has been just a nightmare. But on another hand, I feel a sense of overwhelming dread because I know exactly that regardless of the outcome chaos is going to unfold like if we see a biden victory uh trump supporters may rebel if we see a trump victory that's going to be like four more years of um torture with donald trump so i mean either way i'm i'm bracing myself um hoping for the best but expecting the worst and i'm sure you all feel the same way so um we'll definitely talk about it i don't plan to do a live stream uh during election night because I just have way too much like anxiety and I'm glued to numbers and I'm switching between live streams. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess, right? Um, so I'll, of course, do my post-election wrap-ups. And also, I don't know that we're going to get a winner on that first night. I, I think probably we, we won't know who wins until after Tuesday. It may take a week or even longer. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. You know, of course, I'm not going to miss that. So I'm rambling now. So I'll see you all next week.
Take care.